we talk about the skills laboratory before the operating room theater. So you practice in the laboratory before you earn the right to appear in the theater. I talk a lot about learner-centered teaching as opposed to teacher-centered teaching. And I think when I began my career, it was entirely teacher-centered. I believe that if you had enough PowerPoint slides and they were beautifully designed, and you were eloquent enough at the podium, that's all that mattered. Instead of really paying attention to what is it that the student needs to learn. And so now we talk about teachable moments, really observing student action, looking at the way they write about their patients and the way they describe their patients and the way they examine patients and recognizing those deficiencies, that's the teachable moment. That's what the focus of teaching is. So it gets you away from my script. If the topic is gallbladder disease, this is my script for teaching and instead, what is it you need to know and what can I teach you that will help you in your education? Early on, I became convinced that the operating room was not always the best place to learn complex technical skills. It's stressful, it's noisy, it's chaotic, and even learning curve literature pointed out that in lower stress environments, residents would be able to learn. And so we would put them in a skills laboratory under optimal conditions and do what we call deliberate practice. That is a skill designed for their level, given optimal feedback when they perform it, and the opportunities to repeat and correct errors, that's ideal for learning a surgical skill. Seldom is that met in the setting of an operating room. And so early on, I became absolutely convinced the future for training surgeons has to begin in a surgical skills laboratory. When we would go to hospital administration and say, we need the funds to build a laboratory, they would raise eyebrows and wonder, why is this necessary? We've never done this before. The way we sold it to hospital administrators was the patient safety angle. And literature began to emerge that residents who train in a skills laboratory operate more quickly, they make fewer errors, and now there's even data showing there's better patient outcomes. And so suddenly we got really the ear of administrators that said, this is a very reasonable investment for patient safety. Uh, and that was really important in the early days before surgical skills laboratories became commonplace. So in our surgical education team meetings at Southern Illinois University, we constantly were focusing on what we can do to improve the quality of teaching in the operating room. And one day my PhD educator came to me and said, let me observe you in the OR and I'll come up with something. She watched me for a series of days and came back and introduced the BID method of teaching in the OR. It's a way of, with a particular trainee, briefing at the scrub sink what we're going to focus on, then focusing on that in the operating room, and then debriefing at the end of the case. In the operating room, the I stands for interoperative teaching. We focus on that particular skill and give them all the feedback we can Im imagine that will improve their skill. At the end of the case, we debrief the D and say, what will you do differently the next time to improve in this one area that you're struggling with? And that simple technology called the BID method that's published now uh, for over a decade has really been used across the United States as a simple, easy to remember method to dramatically improve teaching in the operating room. I think over the years, my feelings about training future residents as surgeons, independent surgeons, I'm looking first of all for those that already have a demonstrated record of professionalism. Secondly, I'm looking for someone who really is passionate about surgical skill. That means willing to spend the time in the operating room and as well as in the surgical skills laboratory and constantly on a journey of continuing to improve your surgical skill. That's something you continue to work on until the day you leave the practice. And then I think finally, the hardest to teach is we're looking for a surgeon with good judgment not just how to move your hands, more importantly, when to operate, when not to operate, what kind of procedure to do. Those kinds of things are really difficult to teach. We're still struggling, but I think our residents often learn by example from really master surgeons in our program. Uh, but those are the three things I think are critical uh, for making a good surgeon. and an ability to explain why I teach the way I do today, the best way to think of it is connoisseurship. Everywhere I went, 
Whether it was to teaching conferences or other universities, I was constantly analyzing, almost like a movie critic would, and how could this be done better? And I think that probably is how I refined my teaching technique over the years. I would get a great idea, take it back in a clerkship or in resident teaching and try it, see if it worked. Didn't always work and so often I abandoned, but it was that trial and error, trying to constantly improve my ability as a teacher. I think that's probably been the single factor that's led to my current teaching philosophy and the way I teach today.